connaissances, connaissances, connaissances recherches, recherches, sciences, sciences mathématiques, théorie, physique, philosophie, philosophie conférences, archéologie, nature. nature. Je crois que nous allons pouvoir commencer. C'est pour moi un plaisir et un honneur particulier que d'accueillir ce soir Robert Bandon, que l'Assemblée des professeurs du Collège de France a souhaité inviter à l'occasion de sa venue pour le colloque qui sera consacré à Wilfried Sellars. Donc je vous rappelle qu'il aura lieu ce jeudi, jeudi et vendredi, dans ce même amphithéâtre. Donc l'amphithéâtre Guillaume Budet, le colloque commencera. Euh, donc jeudi, euh, jeudi 28 à 9h15, hein, donc dans, cette même, dans ce même amphithéâtre. Et vous aurez d'ailleurs, ceux d'entre vous qui le souhaitent, auront d'ailleurs l'occasion d'entendre à nouveau euh, Robert Vandon dans le cadre de, de ce colloque. Alors je n'ai pas besoin, je pense, de le, de le présenter longuement parce qu'il est, euh, est suffisamment connu euh, pour que je puisse m'en dispenser. Je rappellerai simplement qu'il est professeur à l'université de Pittsburgh il a publié un nombre considérable d'ouvrages et d'articles. Je mentionnerai simplement un des derniers, intitulé « Between Saying and Doing, Thoughts and Analytic Pragmatism euh, », entre dire et faire vers un pragmatisme analytique, qui est paru en 2008, et parmi euh, les nombreux ouvrages qu'il avait publiés auparavant, il y en a deux que je, dont je rappellerai euh, l'existence, parce qu'ils sont en cours de traduction, donc on pourra, ils pourront bientôt être lus en français. Il s'agit d'un de, des plus connus, « Making it explicit, reasoning, representing and discursive commitment qui », qui a été publié en 1994 et qui est en train d'être traduit aux éditions du CERF. Et euh, c'est la même chose avec euh, « Articulating reasons, an introduction to uh, inferentialism », qui a été publié en 2000 et qui est également euh, en cours de traduction. Euh, aux éditions du CERF. Alors, euh, le titre de, de la conférence que Robert Bandon euh, va donner ce soir est euh, « How analytic philosophy has failed cognitive science », ce qui pourrait, me semble-t-il, être traduit euh, en français à peu près par « Comment euh, la philosophie analytique a euh, manqué à ou a fait défaut à euh, la science cognitive ». Alors, il y a un sentiment qui est, euh, qui est assez répandu depuis un certain temps déjà, qui est que la philosophie analytique est entrée dans une phase de déclin et qu'elle a été supplantée, ou en tout cas devrait l'être, largement par les sciences cognitives. Alors c'est un sentiment qui est, qui est plus ou moins diffus, mais qui est aussi parfois exprimé assez ouvertement. Et de temps à autre, certains vont même jusqu'à suggérer que la philosophie analytique, aujourd'hui, sur des questions notamment comme celle de la, de la philosophy of mind, de la philosophie de l'esprit, défend des positions qui peuvent être qualifiées, pour dire le moins, de, de conservatrices, voire même obscur, réactionnaires ou obscurant, et obscurantistes, alors que le, la nouveauté et le progrès sont représentés par les sciences cognitives. Alors, euh, bon, le, le titre que, que, que Robert Mandon a, a choisi pour, pour sa conférence dit, dit bien ce qu'il dit. Il suggère que quelque chose a manqué euh, aux sciences cognitives, mais ça n'est pas entièrement, il aura l'occasion de vous l'expliquer, beaucoup mieux que je ne saurais le faire, ça n'est pas entièrement, ni même peut-être principalement, la faute de, des sciences cognitives. Hein. Le problème est que, euh, en un certain sens, la philosophie analytique a manqué à ses devoirs euh, à l'égard de, euh, des sciences cognitives et peut-être même de la communauté intellectuelle en général. C'est-à-dire, euh, il y avait un certain nombre de leçons très importantes à tirer de la philosophie analytique, en particulier de Frégueux, Robert Vandome aura l'occasion de je crois, de parler assez longuement de, de Frégueux et de, de la dette considérable que nous avons encore aujourd'hui à l'égard de Frégueux, qui, qui n'a peut-être pas été complètement euh, intégré, et même dans certains cas, ne, ne l'a pas été du tout. Donc, il y avait un certain nombre de leçons euh, importantes à tirer de la philosophie analytique, en particulier en ce qui concerne les concepts, le, la façon dont, euh, dont les concepts sont organisés de façon hiérarchique, l'usage des concepts, les conditions de leur... Euh, les conditions de l'apprentissage, de la maîtrise des concepts, etc. Donc ces leçons n'ont, semble-t-il, jamais été véritablement apprises, et euh, sur ce point, euh, Robert Bandom a euh, 
un certain nombre de reproches à adresser aux représentants de la philosophie analytique euh, qui soupçonnent d'avoir préféré, au fond, euh, garder pour eux un certain nombre de connaissances précieuses qu'ils auraient dû accepter, de, euh, qu'ils auraient dû faire l'effort hein, d'essayer de communiquer euh, au, à un public un peu plus vaste et euh, non pas seulement donc, à, à, euh, aux représentants des sciences cognitives, mais peut-être, encore une fois, à la communauté intellectuelle en général. Alors, je n'en dis pas plus euh, sur ce point. Je, pense que, je suis très, moi-même très impatient et je pense que vous l'êtes tous d'entendre Robert Bandom. Je lui donne donc immédiatement la parole. Nous, les analytiques philosophes, avons signalement failé nos collègues en cognitive science. Et nous avons fait ça by not sharing central lessons about the nature of concepts, concept use, and conceptual content that have been entrusted to our care and feeding for more than a century. I take it that analytic philosophy began with the birth of the new logic that Gottlob Frege introduced in his seminal 1879 Begriffsschrift. The idea, taken up and championed to begin with by Bertrand Russell, was that the fundamental insights and tools that Frege made available there and developed and deployed through the 1890s could be applied throughout philosophy to advance our understanding of understanding and thought in general by advancing our understanding of concepts, including the particular concepts with which the philosophical tradition had been concerned since its inception. For Frege brought about a revolution not just in logic, but in semantics. He made possible for the first time a mathematical characterization of meaning and conceptual content, and so of the structure of sapience itself. Henceforth, it was to be the business of the new movement of analytic philosophy to explore and amplify those ideas, to exploit and apply them wherever they could do the most good. Those ideas are our cultural birthright, heritage, and responsibility. But we analytic philosophers have not done right by them, for we failed to communicate some of the most basic of those ideas, have failed to explain their significance, failed to make them available in forms usable by those working in allied disciplines who are also professionally concerned to understand the nature of thought, minds, and reason. Now, contemporary cognitive science is a house with many mansions. The provinces I mean particularly to be addressing are cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, animal psychology, especially primatology, and artificial intelligence. Cognitive psychology aims at reverse engineering the human mind, figuring out how we do what we do, what more basic abilities are recruited and deployed, and how, so as to result in the higher cognitive abilities we actually display. Developmental psychology investigates the sequence of stages by which those abilities emerge from the more primitive versions as individual humans mature. Animal psychology, as I'm construing it, is a sort of combination of cognitive psychology of non-human intelligences and a phylogenetic version of the ontogenetic human developmental psychology. And by contrast to all those empirical inquiries into actual cognition, Artificial intelligence swings free of questions about how any actual organisms do what they do and asks instead what constellation of abilities of the sort we know how to implement in artifacts might in principle yield sapience. Each of these disciplines is in its own way concerned with the broadly empirical question of how the trick of cognition is or might be done. Philosophers, by contrast, have been concerned with the normative question of what would count as doing it with what understanding, particularly discursive conceptual understanding, consists in, rather than how creatures with a particular contingent constitution, history, and armamentarium of basic abilities come to exhibit it. I think Frege taught us three fundamental lessons about the structures of concepts, and hence about all possible abilities that deserve to count as concept-using abilities. The conclusions we should draw from his discoveries is that concept use is intrinsically stratified. It exhibits at least four basic layers, with each capacity to deploy concepts in a more sophisticated sense of concept, structurally presupposing the capacity to use concepts in all of the more primitive senses. The three lessons that generate the structural hierarchy oblige us to distinguish first between concepts that only label and concepts that describe. Second, 
between ingredient and freestanding conceptual contents, which make explicit the distinction between the content of concepts and the force of applying them. And third, concepts expressible already by simple predicates and concepts expressible in principle only by complex predicates. AI researchers and cognitive, developmental, and animal psychologists need to take account of the different grades of conceptual content that are made visible by these distinctions, both in order to be clear about the topic they're investigating. After all, if they're going to tell us how the trick is to be done, they need to be clear about exactly which trick it is, and because the empirical and in principle possibilities are constrained by the way the abilities to deploy concepts in all these various senses structurally presuppose the others that appear earlier in the sequence. This is a point cognitive scientists have long appreciated on the side of basic syntactic complexity. But the at least equally important, and I would argue more conceptually fundamental, hierarchy of semantic complexity has been largely ignored. So first, I want to talk about the transition from labeling to describing. The early modern philosophical tradition was built around a classificatory theory of consciousness and hence of concepts, in part the result of what its scholastic predecessors had made of their central notion of Aristotelian forms. The paradigmatic cognitive act for them is understood as classifying, taking something particular as being of some general kind. Concepts are then identified with the general kinds. This conception was enshrined in an order of logical explanation originating in Aristotle's prior analytics that was common to everyone thinking about concepts and consciousness in the period leading up to Kant. At its base is a doctrine of terms or concepts, particular and general. The next layer, erected on that base, is a doctrine of judgments, describing the kinds of classificatory relations that are possible among such terms. For instance, besides classifying Socrates as human, humans can be classified as mortal. Finally, in terms of those meta-classifications, grouping judgments into kinds according to the sorts of terms they relate, a doctrine of consequences or syllogisms is propounded, classifying valid inferences into kinds depending on which classes of classificatory judgments their premises and conclusions fall under. It's the master idea of classification that gives this traditional order of explanation its distinctive shape. That idea defines its base, the relation between its layers, and the theoretical aspiration that animates the whole line of thought, namely finding suitable ways of classifying terms and judgments, classifiers and classifications, so as to be able eventually to classify inferences as good or bad solely in virtue of the kinds of classifications they involve. The fundamental meta-conceptual role it plays in structuring philosophical thought about thought evidently makes understanding the concept of classifying itself a particularly urgent philosophical task. Besides asking, as the tradition did, what differentiates various kinds of classif classifying, we can ask what they have in common. What is it one must do in order thereby to count as classifying something as being of some kind? In the most general sense, one classifies something simply by responding to it differentially. Stimuli are grouped into kinds by the response kinds they tend to elicit. In this very general sense, a chunk of iron classifies its environments into kinds by rusting in some of them and not others, increasing or decreasing its temperature, shattering or remaining intact. Of course, as is evident from that example, if classifying is just exercising a reliable differential responsive disposition, it's a ubiquitous feature already of the inanimate world. And for that very reason, classifying in this generic sense is not an attractive candidate for identification with conceptual, cognitive, or conscious activity. It just doesn't draw the right line between thinking and all sorts of thoughtless activities. Panpsychism is too high a price to pay for cognitive naturalism. But that need not mean that taking differential responsiveness as the genus of which conceptual classification is a species is a bad idea. I'm going to skip a bit now. Classification as the exercise of reliable differential responsive dispositions, however they're acquired, I've said is not itself yet a good candidate for conceptual classification. 
particularly in the basic sense in which applying a concept to something is describing it. Why not? Suppose one were given a wand and told that the light on the handle would go on if and only if what the wand was pointed at had the property of being grivy, something one had never heard of before. One man might then determine empirically that speakers are grivy, but microphones are not. Doorknobs are, but window shades are not. Cats are, and dogs are not, and so on. One would then be in a position reliably, perhaps even infallibly, to apply the label grivy. Is one also in a position at that point to describe things as grivy? What what one is doing to qualify as applying the concept grivy to things? Intuitively, I think, the trouble is that one does not know what one has found out when one has found out that something is grivy. Doesn't know what one is taking it to be when one takes it to be grivy. Doesn't know what one is describing it as. The label, we want to say, is uninformative. What more is required? Wilfred Sellers gives this succinct and, I believe, correct answer. He says, It's only because the expressions in terms of which we describe objects locate these objects in a space of implications that they describe at all rather than merely label. End of the quote. The reason grivy is a mere label, that it classifies without informing, is that nothing follows from so classifying an object. To vary the example... If I discover that all the boxes in the attic I'm charged with cleaning out have been labeled with red, yellow, or green stickers, all I learn is that those labeled with the same color must share some property. To learn what they mean is to learn, for instance, that the owner put a red label on the boxes to be discarded, green on those to be kept, and yellow on those that needed further sorting and decision. Once I know what follows from affixing one rather than another label, I can understand them not as mere labels, but as descriptions of the boxes to which they're applied. Description, that is, is classification with consequences, either immediately practical, to be discarded, examined, kept, or consequences for further classifications. Michael Dummett has argued generally that to be understood as conceptually contentful, Expressions must not have not only circumstances of appropriate application, but also appropriate consequences of application. That is, one must look not only upstream to the circumstances in which it's appropriate to apply the expression, but also downstream to the consequences of doing so in order to grasp the content it expresses. One-sided theories of meaning, which sees on one aspect to the exclusion of the other, are bound to be defective, for they omit aspects of the use that are essential to the meaning of the expression. For instance, expressions can have the same circumstances of application and different consequences of application. And when they do, they'll have different descriptive content. So, one, I will write a book about Hegel, and two, I foresee that I'll write a book about Hegel, say different things about the world. They describe it as being different ways. The first describes my future activity and accomplishment. The second, my present aspiration. Yet the circumstances under which it's appropriate or warranted to assert them, the situations to which I ought reliably to respond by endorsing them, are the same, or at least they can be made so by a light regimentation of a prediction expressing use of foresee. Here, to say that they have different descriptive content could also be put by saying they have different truth conditions. That they have the same assertability conditions just shows how assertability theories of meaning, as one-sided in Dummett's sense, go wrong. But that same fact shows up in the different positions they occupy in what Sellers called the space of implications. For from the first, it follows that I will not immediately be struck by lightning, that I will write some book, and indeed that I'll write a book about Hegel. None of those is in the same sense a consequence of the second claim. Again, we might train a parrot reliably to respond differentially to the visible presence of red things by squawking, rock, that's red. It would not yet be describing things as red, would not be applying the concept red to them, because the noise it makes has no significance for it. The parrot doesn't know that it follows from something's being red, that it's colored, that it cannot be wholly green, and so on. And ignorant as it is of those inferential consequences, the parrot doesn't grasp the content. 
the concept any more than we express a concept by gravy if all we have is the wand. The lesson is that even observational concepts whose principal circumstances of appropriate application are non-inferential, a matter of reliable dispositions to respond differentially to non-linguistic stimuli, even observational concepts must have inferential consequences in order to make possible description, as opposed to the sort of classification affected by non-conceptual labels. This rationalist idea that the inferential significance of a state or expression is essential to its con conceptual contentfulness is one of the central insights of Frege's Begriffsschrift, his concept writing, which I remind you is the founding document of modern logic and semantics. And that principle is appealed to him, in the, appealed to by him in the opening paragraphs to define his topic. He says, quote, there are two ways in which the contents of two judgments may differ. It may or it may not be the case that all inferences that can be drawn from the first judgment when combined with certain other ones can always also be drawn from the second when combined with the same other judgments. If it, the part that's the, I call that part of the content that's the same in both the conceptual content, begrifflicher inhalt, end of the quote. Here, then, is the first lesson that analytic philosophy ought to have taught cognitive science. There's a fundamental meta-conceptual distinction between classification in the sense of labeling and classification in the sense of describing. And it consists in the inferential consequences of the classification, its capacity to serve as a premise in inferences, whether practical or theoretical, to further conclusions. I think there's probably no point in fighting over the minimal circumstances of application of the concept concept and conceptual. Those who want to lower the bar sufficiently are welcome to consider purely classificatory labels as a kind of concept, perhaps so as not to be beastly to the beasts or to disqualify human infants, bits of our brains, or even some relatively complex computer programs entirely and in principle from engaging in conceptually articulated activities. But if they decide to talk that way, they must not then combine those circumstances of application with the consequences of application that are appropriate to genuinely descriptive concepts, that is, those that do come with inferential significances downstream from their application. All right, now I want to talk about the second distinction between ingredient and freestanding content how we can semantically separate content from force. Once our attention has been directed at the significance of applying a classifying concept, downstream at the consequences of applying it, rather than just upstream at the repeatables it discriminates, the grouping it institutes, so that mere classification is properly distinguished from descriptive classification, the necessity of distinguishing different kinds of consequence becomes apparent. Discursive intentional phenomena and their associated concepts, such as assertion, inference, judgment, experience, representation, perception, action, endorsement, and imagination, typically involve what Sellers calls the notorious ing-ed ambiguity. For under these headings, we may be talking about the act of asserting, inferring, judging, experiencing, representing, perceiving, doing, endorsing, or imagining, or we may be talking about the content that's asserted, inferred, judged, experienced, represented, perceived, done, endorsed, or imagined. Description is one of those ambiguous terms, as is classification. We ought to be aware of the distinction between the act of describing or classifying, applying a concept on the one hand, and the content of the description classification or concept, how things are described, classified, or conceived on the other. And the distinction is not merely of theoretical importance for those of us thinking systematically about concept use. A distinctive level of conceptual sophistication is achieved by concept users that themselves distinguish between the contents of their concepts and their activity of applying them. So, for instance, one thing one might want to know about a system being studied say, a non-human animal, a prelinguistic human, an artifact we're building, is whether it distinguishes between the concept it applies and what it does by applying it. 
For the inferential consequences of applying a classificatory concept, when doing that is describing and not merely labeling, can be either semantic consequences, which turn on the content of the concept being applied, or pragmatic consequences, which turn on the act one is performing in applying it. Suppose John issues an observation report. The traffic light is red. You may infer that the light is operating and illuminated, and the traffic ought to stop in the direction it governs. You may also infer that John has a visually unobstructed line of sight to the light, that he notices what color it is and believes that it's red. Unlike the former inferences, these last are not inferences from what John said, from the content of his utterance, from the concepts he's applied. They're inferences from his saying it, from the pragmatic force or significance of his uttering it, from the fact of his applying those concepts. For what he said, that the traffic light is red, could be true even if John had not been in a position to notice it or form any beliefs about it. Nothing about John follows just from the color of the traffic light. Now, it can be controversial whether a particular consequence follows from how something's described or from describing it that way. That is, whether that consequence is part of the descriptive content of an expression, the concept applied, or stems rather from the force of using the expression, from applying the concept. A famous example is expressivist theories of evaluative terms such as good. In their most extreme form, this sort of theory claims that those terms have no descriptive content at all. All their consequences stem from what one is doing in using them. Calling something good is commending, endorsing, or approving it. In his lapidary article, Ascriptivism, Peter Geach asks what the rules governing this move are. He offers the archaic English term macarize, meaning to characterize someone as happy. Should we say that in apparently describing someone as happy, we're not really describing anyone, but rather performing the distinctive speech act of macarizing? But why not then discern a distinctive speech act for any apparently descriptive term? What are the rules of this game? What's wanted, Geach saw, is a criterion for distinguishing semantic from pragmatic consequences, those that stem from the content of a concept being applied from those that stem from what we're doing in applying that concept, using an expression to perform a speech act. Geach finds one in Frege, who in turn was develop developing a point made already by Kant. The logical tradition Kant inherited was built around the classificatory theory of consciousness that I began by considering. And judgment was accordingly understood as classification or predication, paradigmatically of something particular as something general. But we've now put ourselves in a position to ask, is this view intended as a model of how judgeable contents are constructed or of what one is doing in judging? Kant saw, as Frege would see after him, that the phenomenon of compound judgments shows it cannot play both roles, as it was traditionally intended to do. For consider the hypothetical or conditional judgment three. If Frege is correct, then conceptual content depends on inferential consequences. In asserting this sentence, making this judgment, endorsing its content, have I predicated correctness of Frege? Have I classified him as correct? Have I described him as correct? Have I applied the concept of correctness? If so, then predicating or classifying or describing is not yet judging. For in asserting the conditional, I have not judged or asserted that Frege is correct. I have at most built up a judgeable content, the antecedent of the conditional, by predication. For embedding a declarative descriptive sentence as an unasserted component in a compound asserted sentence strips off the pragmatic force that its freestanding unembedded occurrence would otherwise have had. It contributes now only its content to the content of the compound sentence, to which alone the pragmatic force of the speech act is attached. And that means that embedding simpler sentences as components of compound sentences, paradigmatically embedding them as the antecedents of conditionals, is the way to discriminate the consequences that derive from the content of a sentence from consequences that derive from the act of asserting or endorsing it. We can tell that happy, for instance, does express descriptive content <coughs> 
and is not simply an indicator that some utterance has the pragmatic force or significance of macarizing, because we can say things like for. If she is happy, then John should be glad. For in asserting that, one does not macarize anyone. No one's been called happy. So the consequence that John should be glad must be due to the descriptive content of the antecedent, not to its force. Similarly, Geach argues that the fact we can say things like five, if being trustworthy is good, then you have reason to be trustworthy, shows that good does have descriptive content. Notice that the same test appropriately discriminates the different descriptive contents of the claims six, labeling is not describing, and seven, I believe that labeling is not describing. For the two do not behave the same way as antecedents of conditionals. The stuttering inference, eight, if labeling is not describing, then labeling is not describing, is as solid an inference as one could ask for, even if it's not very interesting. The corresponding conditional nine, if I believe that labeling is not describing, then labeling is not describing, requires at least a good deal more faith in me to endorse. And in the same way, the embedding test distinguishes sentences one and two before. In each case, it tells us properly that different descriptive contents are involved. I called Geach's ascriptivism essay lapidary. Uh, he refutes the entire expressivist meta-ethical tradition down to his day uh, in a six-page article. He, he makes his argument and then gets out. What all this means is that any user of descriptive concepts who can also found, form compound sentences, paradigmatically conditionals, is in a position to distinguish what pertains to the semantic content of those descriptive concepts from what pertains to the act or pragmatic force of describing by applying those concepts. This capacity is a new, higher, more sophisticated level of concept use. And it can be achieved only by looking at compound sentences in which other descriptive sentences can occur as unasserted components. For instance, it's only in such a context that one can distinguish denial, a kind of speech act or attitude, from negation, a kind of content. One who asserts sentence six has both denied that labeling is describing and negated a description. But one who asserts conditionals such as eight and nine has negated descriptions but hasn't denied anything. The modern philosophical tradition up to Frege took it for granted that there was a special attitude one could adopt towards a descriptive conceptual content, a kind of minimal force one could invest it with that must be possible independently of and antecedently to being able to endorse that content in a judgment. This is the attitude of merely entertaining the description. The picture, for instance, in Descartes, was that first one entertained descriptive thoughts, judgeable contents, and then by an in principle subsequent act of will accepted it or rejected it. Frege rejects that picture. The principle, and for him in principle fundamental pragmatic attitude, and hence speech act, is judging or endorsing. The capacity merely to entertain a proposition, a judgeable content, a description, is a late-coming capacity, and one that's parasitic on the capacity to endorse such contents in judgment. In fact, for Frege, the capacity to entertain without endorsement, the proposition that P, is just the capacity to endorse conditionals in which that proposition occurs as antecedent or consequent. For doing that is to explore its descriptive content, its inferential circumstances and consequences. What follows what it follows from and what follows from it, what would make it true and what would be true if it were true, but without endorsing it. This is a new kind of distanced attitude towards one's concepts and their contents, and it's one that becomes possible only in virtue of the capacity to form compound sentences of the kind of which conditionals are a paradigm. It's a new level of cognitive achievement, not new in the sense of a new kind of empirical knowledge, though conditionals can indeed codify new empirical discoveries, but rather a new kind of semantic self-consciousness. Conditionals make possible a new sort of hypothetical thought. Descriptive concepts bring empirical properties into view. 
Embedding those concepts in conditionals brings the contents of those concepts into view in the same sense. Creatures that can do that are functioning at a higher cognitive and conceptual level than those who can only apply descriptive concepts, just as those who can apply descriptive concepts are functioning at a higher con cognitive and conceptual level than those who can only classify things by reliable responsive discrimination, that is, labeling. And that fact sets a question for the different branches of cognitive science I mentioned in my introduction. Can chimps or African gray parrots or other non-human animals not just use concepts to describe things, but also semantically discriminate the contents of those concepts from the force of applying them by using them not just in describing, but in conditionals in which their contents are merely entertained and explored? And at what age? And along with what other capacities do human children learn to do so? What's required for a computer to demonstrate this level of cognitive functioning? Conditionals are special because they make inferences explicit. That is, they put those inferences into endorsable, judgeable, assertable, which is to say propositional form. And it's their role in inferences, we saw, that distinguishes descriptive concepts from mere classifying labels. But conditionals are an instance of a more general phenomenon. For we can think of them more abstractly as operators, which apply to sentences to yield further sentences. As such, they bring into view a new notion of conceptual content, a new principle of assimilation, hence classification, of such conceptual contents. For we begin with the idea of sameness of content that derives from sameness of pragmatic force, attitude, or speech act. But the frege geech argument shows that we can also individuate conceptual con content, contents more finely, not just in terms of their role in freestanding utterances, but also accordingly as substituting one for another as arguments of operators, paradigmatically the conditional, does or does not yield compound sentences with the same freestanding pragmatic significance or force. Dummett calls these notions freestanding and ingredient content, respectively. So we might think of the sentence 10, it's nice here, and 11, it's nice where I am, as expressing the same attitude, performing the same speech act, as having the same pragmatic force or significance. After all, they not only have the same circumstances of application, but the same consequences of application, and hence role as antecedents of conditionals. But we can see that they have different ingredient contents by seeing that they behave differently as arguments when we apply a different operator to them. 12, it's always nice here, and 13, it's always nice where I am, have very different circumstances and consequences of application, different pragmatic significances, and those do behave differently as antecedents of conditionals. But this difference in content, this sense of different content, in which they patently do have different contents, is one that shows up only in the context of compounding operators, which apply to sentences and yield further sentences. The capacity to deploy such operators to form new conceptual descriptive contents from old ones accordingly ushers in a new level of cognitive and conceptual functioning. Creatures that cannot merely label but describe are rational at least in the minimal sense that they're able to treat one classification as providing a reason for or against another. If they can use conditionals, they can distinguish inferences that depend on the content of the concept they're applying from those that depend on what they're doing in classifying something as falling under that concept. But the capacity to use conditionals gives them more than just that ability. For conditionals, let them say what's a reason for what. Say that an inference is a good one. And for anyone who can do that, the capacity not just to deny that a classification is appropriate, but to use a negation operator to form new classificatory contents, brings with it the capacity to say that two classifications, classifiers, concepts, are incompatible, that one provides a reason to withhold the other. Creatures that can use this sort of sentential compounding operator are not just rational, but logical creatures and they're capable of a distinctive kind of conceptual self-consciousness. For they can describe the rational relations that make their classifications into descriptions in the first place. 
and hence they can be conscious or aware of them in the same sense in which descriptive concepts allow them to be aware of empirical features of their world. Okay. Now I want to turn to the last distinction between simple and complex predicates and the concepts that correspond to them. For there is still a higher level of structural complexity of concepts and concept use. Now I've claimed that Frege should be credited with appreciating both of the points I've made so far. So far. First, that descriptive conceptual classification beyond mere discriminative labeling depends on the inferential significance of the concepts. And second, that semantically distinguishing the inferential significance of the contents of concepts from that of the force of applying them depends on forming sentential compounds, paradigmatically conditionals, in which other sentences appear as components. In each of those insights, Frege had predecessors. Leibniz, in his new essay on the human understanding, had already argued the first point against Locke. And Kant, we've seen, appreciated how attention to compound sentences, including his hypotheticals, requires substantially amending the traditional classificatory theory of conceptual consciousness. The final distinction I'll discuss, that between simple and complex predicates and the corresponding kinds of concepts they express, is Frege's alone. No one before him, and embarrassingly few even of his admirers after him, grasped this idea. Frege's most famous achievement is transforming traditional logic by giving us a systematic way to express and control the inferential roles of quantificationally complex sentences. Frege could, as the whole logical tradition from Aristotle down to his time, fixated as it was on syllogisms, could not handle iterated quantifiers. So he could explain, for instance, why 14, if someone is loved by everyone, then everyone loves someone, is true, it's a conditional that codifies a correct inference. But 15, if everyone loves someone, then someone is loved by everyone, is not. What's less appreciated, I think, is that in order to specify the inferences involving arbitrarily nested quantifiers, here some and every, Frege needed to introduce a new kind of predicate and hence discern a structurally new kind of concept. Our first grip on the notion of a predicate is as a component of sentences. In artificial languages, we combine, for instance, a two-place predicate P with two individual constants A and B to form the sentence PAB. Logically-minded philosophers of language use this model to think about the corresponding sentences of natural language, understanding 16, Kant, Kant admired Rousseau, as formed by applying the two-place predicate admired to the singular terms Kant and Rousseau. The kind of inferences that are made explicit by quantified conditionals Inferences that essentially depend on the contents of the predicates involved, though, require us to distinguish a one-place predicate related to but distinct from this two-place one, one that's exhibited by 17, Rousseau admired Rousseau, and 18, Kant admired Kant, but not by 16. 19, someone admired himself, follows from 17 and 18, but not from 16. The property of being a self-admirer differs from that of being an admirer and from that of being admired, even though it entails both. But notice, there's no part of the sentences 17 and 18 that they share with each other that they do not also share with 16. Looking just at the subsentential expressions out of which the sentences are built does not reveal the respective similarity that distinguishes self-admiration from admiration in general. And that's a respect of similarity that's crucial to understanding why the conditional 20, if someone admired himself, then someone admires someone, expresses a good inference, while 21, if someone admires someone, then someone admires himself, does not. For what sentences 17 and 18 share that distinguishes them from 16 is not a component or a part of them, but a pattern. More specifically, it's a pattern of cross-identification of the singular terms that two-place predicate applies to. The repeatable expression kind that is a part of those sentences, admires, is a simple predicate. It occurs as a component in sentences built up by concatenating it appropriately with a pair of singular terms. X admires X is a complex predicate. And a number of different complex predicates are associated with any multi-place simple predicate. 
So the three-place simple predicate used to form the sentence 22, John enjoys music recorded by Mark and books recommended by Bob, generates not only a three-place complex predicate of the form RXYZ, but also two-place complex predicates of the form RXXY, RXYY, and RXYX, as well as the one-place complex predicate RXXX. The complex predicates can be thought of as patterns that can be exhibited by sentences formed using the simple predicate, or as equivalence classes of such sentences. So, the complex self-admiration predicate can be thought of either as the pattern, rather than the part, that's common to all the sentences, Rousseau admired Rousseau, Kant admired Kant, Caesar admired Caesar, Brutus admired Brutus, Napoleon admired Napoleon, and so on, or just as that set of sentences. Any member of such an equivalence class of sentences sharing a complex predicate can be turned into any other by a sequence of substitutions of all occurrences of one singular term by occurrences of another. Substitution is a kind of decomposition of sentences, including, importantly, compound ones formed using sentential operators such as conditionals. After sentences have been built up using simple components, singular terms, simple predicates, sentential operators, they can be assembled into equivalence classes, that is, patterns can be discerned among them, by regarding some of the elements as systematically replaceable by others. This is the same procedure of noting invariance under substitution that we saw applies when the notion of freestanding applies to the notion of freestanding content to give rise to the notion of ingredient content when the operators apply only to whole sentences. Frege called what's invariant under substitution of some sentential components for others a function. A function can be applied to some arguments to yield a value, but it's not part of the value it yields. So for instance, one can apply the function capital of to Sweden to yield the value Stockholm but neither Sweden nor capital of is part of Stockholm. Frege tied himself in some metaphysical knots trying to find a clear way of contrasting functions with things, objects. But two points emerge clearly from his discussion. First, discerning the substitutional relations among different sentences sharing some simple predicate is crucial for characterizing a wide range of inferential patterns. And second, those inferential patterns articulate the contents of a whole new class of concepts. Now, sentential compounding had already provided the means to build new simple concepts out of old ones. The Boolean con connectives, conjunction, disjunction, negation, and the conditional definable in terms of them, permit the combination of simple predicates in all the ways representable by Venn diagrams, corresponding to intersection, union, complementation, and inclusion of sets, concept extensions represented by regions, and so the expression of new concepts formed from the old ones by those operations. But there's a crucial class of new analytically complex concepts formable from the old ones that are not generable by such compounding procedures. One cannot, for instance, form the concept of a C such that for every A there is a B that stands to that C in the relation R. That's a complex one-place predicate that logicians would represent as having the form the set of all x's such that cx, and for all y, there is a z uh, such that uh, rxz. As Frege says, such a concept cannot, as Boolean ones can, be formed simply by putting together pieces of the boundaries of the concepts a, b, and c. The correlations of elements of those sets, that concepts like these those expressed by complex predicates depend on, and so the inferences they're involved in cannot be represented by Venn diagrams. And Frege showed, further, that it's just concepts like this that even the simplest mathematics works with. The concept of a natural number is the concept of a set, every element of which has a successor. That is, for every number, there's another related to it as a successor. The decisive advance that Frege's new quantificational logic made over traditional logic is a semantic expressive advance. His logical notation can, as the traditional logic could not, form complex predicates, and so both express a vitally important kind of concept and logically codify the inferences that articulate its descriptive content. So complex concepts can be thought of as formed by a four-stage process. <clears throat> 
First, put together simple predicates and singular terms to form a set of sentences. Then apply sentential operators to form compound sentences. Then substitute variables for some of the singular terms to form complex predicates. And finally, apply quantifiers to bind some of those variables to form new complex predicates. If one likes, this process can now be repeated, with the complex predicates just formed playing the role that simple predicates originally played at the first stage, yielding new sentences. They can then be conjoined and the individual constants substituted for to yield further one-place complex predicates. We can use these procedures to build to the sky, repeating these stages of concept construction as often as we like. And remarkably, Frege's rules tell us how to compute the inferential roles of the concepts formed at each stage on the basis solely of the inferential roles of the raw materials and the operations applied at this stage. This is the heaven of complex concept formation that he opened up for us. Well, I'm now in a position to conclude. The result of all these considerations, which I remind you have been in place since the dawn of analytic philosophy well over a century ago, is a four-stage semantic hierarchy of ever more demanding senses of concept and concept use. At the bottom are concepts reliably differentially applied, possibly learned, labels or classifications. Crudely behaviorist psychological theories, such as Skinner's, attempted to do all their explanatory work with responsive discriminations of this sort. At the next level, concepts as descriptions emerge when merely classifying concepts come to stand in inferential, evidential, or justificatory relations to one another, when the propriety of one sort of classification has the practical significance of making others appropriate or inappropriate in the sense of serving as reasons for or against them. At the second level, conceptual content first takes a distinctively propositional form. Applications of this sort of concept are accordingly appropriately expressed using declarative sentences. For the propositional content such sentences express just are whatever can play the role of premise and conclusion in inferences. And it's precisely being able to play those roles that distinguishes applications of descriptive concepts from applications of merely classificatory ones. Building on the capacity to use inferentially articulated descriptive concepts to make propositionally contentful judgments or claims, the capacity to form sentential compounds, paradigmatically conditionals, which make endorsements of material inferences relating descriptive concept applications propositionally explicit, and again negations, which make endorsements of material incompatibilities relating descriptive concept applications propositionally explicit, bring with it the capacity to deploy a further, more sophisticated kind of conceptual content, ingredient as opposed to freestanding content. Conceptual content of this sort is to be understood in terms of the contribution it makes to the content of compound judgments in which it occurs, and only thereby indirectly to the force or pragmatic significance of endorsing that content. So ingredient content is what can be negated or conditionalized. The distinctive sort of definiteness and determinateness that's characteristic of this sort of conceptual content becomes vivid when it's contrasted with contents that can be used as labels that cannot appear in such sentential compounds, such as that expressed, for instance, by pictures. My young son once complained about a park sign consisting of a silhouette of what looked like a Scottish terrier surrounded by a red circle with a slash through it. Familiar with the force of prohibition associated with signs of this general form, he wanted to know, does this mean no Scotties allowed, or no dogs allowed, or no animals allowed, or no pets allowed? Indeed. With pictures, one has no way of indicating the degree of generality intended. A creature that can understand a claim like, if the red light is on, then there's a biscuit in the drawer, without disagreeing when the light is not on and no biscuit is present, or immediately looking for the biscuit, regardless of how it is with the light, has learned to distinguish between the content of descriptive concepts and the force of applying them, and as a result can entertain and explore those concepts and their connections with each other without necessarily applying them in the sense of endorsing their applicability to anything present. The capacity in this way to free oneself from the bonds of the here and now is a distinctive kind of conceptual achievement. So the first step 
was from merely discriminating, discriminating classification to rational classification. Rational because inferentially articulated, according to which classifications provide reasons for which others. The second step is to synthetic logical concept formation, in which concepts are formed by logical compounding operators, paradigmatically conditionals and negation. The final step is to analytical concept formation, in which the sentential compounds formed at the third stage are decomposed by noting invariance under substitution. Systematically assimilating sentences into various equivalence classes, accordingly as they can be regarded as substitutional variants of one another, is a distinctive kind of analysis of those compound sentences, as involving the application of concepts that were not components out of which they were originally constructed. Concepts formed by this sort of analysis are substantially and in principle more expressively powerful than those available at earlier stages in the hierarchy of conceptual complexity. And as I've said, they are, for instance, indispensable in even the simplest mathematics. Now, I want to insist this hierarchy is not a psychological one. It's a logical and semantic one. Concepts at the higher levels of complexity presuppose those at the lower levels not because creatures of a certain kind cannot in practice, as a matter of fact, deploy the more complex kinds unless they can deploy the simpler ones, but because in principle it's structurally impossible to do so. Nothing could count as grasping or deploying the kinds of concept that populate the upper reaches of the hierarchy without also grasping or deploying those drawn from its lower levels. The dependencies involved are not empirical, but metaconceptual and normative. The Phrygian considerations that enforce the distinctions between and the sequential arrangement of concept kinds do not arise from studying how concept users actually work, but from investigation of what concept use fundamentally is. They concern not how the trick is done, the trick of concept use, but what could in principle count as doing it. And that's a normative, not an empirical issue. And that's why it's philosophers who first came across the semantic hierarchical metaconceptual structure of concept kinds. But cognitive scientists need to know about it, for it's part of the job of the disciplines that cognitive science comprises to examine, each from its own distinctive point of view, all four grades of conceptual activity, the use of more complex and sophisticated kinds of concepts, no less than that of the simpler and less articulated sorts. The move from merely classificatory to genuinely descriptive concepts, for instance, marks a giant step forward in the phylogenetic development of sapience. But I don't think we yet know what non-human creatures are capable of taking that step. Human children clearly do cross that boundary. But when? By what means? At what age or stage of development? Can non-human primates learn to use conditionals? Has anyone ever tried to, to teach them? The only reason to focus on that capacity, out of all the many linguistic constructions one might investigate empirically in this regard, is an appreciation of the distinctive kind of semantic self-consciousness about rational relations among classifications, which marks the move from classification to rational description, that conditionals make possible. Computer scientists have, to be sure, expended some significant effort in thinking about varieties of possible implementation of sentential compounding. For instance, in exploring what connectionist or parallel distributed processing systems can do. But they've not, in the same way, appreciated the significance of the question of whether, to what extent, and how such vehicleless representational architectures can capture the full range of concepts expressed by complex predicates. After all, those systems' lack of syntactically compositional explicit symbolic representations prohibits the standard way of expressing those concepts, for that way presides proceeds precisely by substitutional decomposition of just such explicit symbolic representations. These are merely examples of potentially important questions raised by the hierarchy of conceptual complexity that cognitive scientists have by and large not been moved so much as to ask. Why not? Well, I think it's pretty clear that the answer is ignorance. Specifically, it's ignorance of the considerations put forward already by Frege that draw the bright semantic metaconceptual lines between different grades of concepts and arrange them in a strict presuppositional semantic hierarchy. Any adequately trained cognitive scientist, even those working in disciplines far removed from computational linguistics, 
can be presumed to have at least passing familiarity with the similarly four-membered Chomsky hierarchy that lines up kinds of grammar, autom automaton, and syntactic complexities of languages and grammars in an array from the most basic, finite state automata, computing regular languages, specifiable by the simplest sort of grammatical rules, to most sophisticated, two-stack pushdown automata, computing recursively innumerable languages, specifiable by unrestricted grammatical rules. But the at least equally significant semantic distinctions I've been retailing have not similarly become a part of the common wisdom and theoretical toolbox of cognitive science, even though they've been available for at least a half century longer. The cost of that ignorance in questions not asked, theoretical constraints not appreciated, promising avenues of empirical research not pursued is great. Failure to appreciate the distinctions and relations among fundamentally different kinds of concepts has led, I think, to a standing tendency systematically to overestimate the extent to which one has constructed in AI or discerned in development, whether by human children or non-human primates, or reverse engineered in psychology, what we users of the fanciest sort of concepts do. And that underlying ignorance is culpable. But it's not the cognitive scientists who are culpable for their ignorance. The ideas in question are those that originally launched the whole enterprise of analytic philosophy. I think it's fair to say that as we philosophers have explored those ideas, we've gotten clearer about them in many respects. For one reason or another, though, we haven't shared the insights we've achieved. We're culpable for having kept this treasure trove to ourselves, and it's high time we were more generous in sharing these ideas. Thank you. Je remercie Robert Brandom pour cette conférence qui, je dois le dire, m'a donné énormément à réfléchir. Je l'ai écouté avec un plaisir particulier. Euh, C'est toujours avec plaisir qu'on qu entend quelqu'un rendre un hommage aussi vibrant, si je puis dire, à Frégueux, puisque d'une certaine façon, euh, au lieu d'intituler sa conférence « Comment le, la philosophie analytique a fait des faux rats ou a manqué à euh, la science cognitive », il aurait presque pu l'intituler « Comment Frégueux a manqué à la science cognitive » ou « Comment la science cognitive a, a commis l'erreur, de façon générale, d'ignorer euh, Frégueux euh, ». Robert Bandon a mentionné, euh, si je l'ai bien compris, donc trois distinctions fondamentales. Euh, que, euh, que la science cognitive, malheureusement, a plus ou moins ignoré. Alors, la première, c'est la distinction entre les, les concepts qui, ont, qui servent simplement à désigner quelque chose, à lui donner un nom, par opposition aux concepts qui servent à, à décrire la chose en question. Donc, entre les concepts qui sont simplement, euh, je ne sais pas comment il faudrait dire, comment faudrait-il traduire « labeling », littéralement « étiquetant », les concepts qui, servent, qui ont pour fonction simplement de, de fournir une étiquette et les concepts qui, qui décrivent hein, les objets qui tombent sous eux. La deuxième distinction, donc, c'est celle qui doit être faite entre le, le, le contenu conceptuel d'un concept et le, la force exercée dans l'application de, de ce concept. Et enfin, la troisième, alors ces deux distinctions avaient déjà été faites avant Frégueux, mais la troisième distinction, d'après Brandom, donc, est une distinction qui est spécifiquement fréguéenne et que personne n'avait fait réellement, en tout cas sous cette forme avant lui, c'est la distinction entre les concepts qui, sont, euh, qui peuvent déjà être exprimés à l'aide de prédicats simples et les concepts qui, en revanche, ne peuvent être exprimés qu'à l'aide de prédicats complexes. Alors, je n'ai bien entendu aucun doute sur le fait que ces, ces trois distinctions sont euh, intrinsèquement euh, d'une importance absolument cruciale. En revanche, euh, je me pose des questions et vous poser peut-être aussi des questions concernant le degré auquel euh, les représentants des sciences cognitives peuvent être soupçonnés d'avoir ignoré ces, ces distinctions. Euh, Brandom, si je l'ai bien compris, semble penser qu'ils les ont ignorées parce qu'ils n'avaient pas besoin d'elles, euh, mais surtout, ils les ont ignorées parce que euh, les philosophes analytiques n'ont pas pris soin de, euh, de, 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 les, de les informer de l'existence, en tout cas de les informer suffisamment de l'existence et de l'importance de ces distinctions. Et là, j'ai une certaine hésitation parce qu'à la, la fin de son exposé, Vandom suggère qu'au fond, les, euh, les représentants des sciences cognitives sont complètement innocents. Euh, ce, ne sont, ce ne sont pas eux qui sont les fautifs, 
leur ignorance, ils, ils ne sont pas coupables de leur, de leur ignorance. Je pense personnellement qu'on est toujours un peu coupable de son ignorance et que par, et par conséquent, j'aurais tendance à être moins indulgent probablement que Vendôme à l'égard des représentants des sciences cognitives. Mais en tout cas, la, la question qui se pose, et peut-être serait-il utile que Vendôme nous en dise un peu plus là-dessus, c'est euh, jusqu'à quel point hein, ces distinctions ont-elles ont été ignorées euh, avec les conséquences euh, regrettables et même désastreuses que ça entraîne par les représentants des sciences cognitives. Je pense que les, les représentants des sciences cognitives auraient probablement des, des protestations à formuler sur ce point. Mais euh, bon, je ne veux pas... Euh, je ne veux pas anticiper sur la, les, la, la discussion à laquelle vous, vous souhaitez sûrement prendre part. Par conséquent, je vais euh, immédiatement donner la parole à ceux d'entre vous qui souhaitent euh, formuler des questions ou des remarques après euh, avoir entendu euh, Vendôme. 